Well, we having a good time? Good time, good time. Wow, this is, uh, this is super. Okay, so I'm going to look at my time here. 55 minutes from this moment, we will be done. <laughs> I'm an old, uh, old college debater, so I live and die by the clock, all right? <clears throat> Every speech is timed. So, <clears throat> yeah, so this is the fourth time back. And um, I thought, well, you know, what, what could I bring that would not redo or, or um, anyway, build on what we've done and build on what you've already heard today. And you've heard a fantastic, I'm sorry I wasn't, didn't hear it, my flights got all messed up yesterday and I got in at midnight last night, which was 3 o'clock this morning my time. So um, I didn't make it to the singing frogs, but I've, I've heard that, and it's just, it, I, I never get tired of it. I could listen to it, you know, every day for two months. I could be a, like an addict. Um, and then, of course, um, the, the next one on the soil is just, uh, just so powerful. So what can I bring that's different? So what I want to do, and I have a workshop this afternoon. So uh, this afternoon, what I'm going to do is um, devote it to the people, relational, um, family, how to get your kids to work with you so they want to work with you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and those kind of things, because, because um, I think one of the things that I can bring to the table here today is some of that business part of farming. You know, it, it Farming is, is way more than a business, but at the end of the day, we can't pay our taxes or put shoes on our feet with altruism, and just because we're saving the earth, somehow we've got we've to put shoes on our feet while we're saving the earth, right? And so, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring some of that, so that'll be my workshop this afternoon, is, is all that whole uh, uh, people part uh, and, and, and labor um, all that kind of thing. So right now, what I want to do is I want to address what I think are the seven primary um, fears that keep us from going forward. And um, it's always amazing to me to ask people that are hobbyists, uh, backyarders, uh, part-timers, and that's all fantastic, okay? But it's always amazing to me to ask people, you know, Mother Earth News readers, um, how many of you, if you, if you could actually make a white-collar salary farming, would leave your town job and do that? It's always exciting. And, and, and I strike this point because so few farmers, I mean, even, even in my community, of, of, it's a very active farming community, there are so few that are actually making a living on a farm. And, and so, and a lot of it is these fears that we have. Um, and the fear, the fear keeps us from being able to step over that thing and, and actually do this. So I am not demeaning or being disrespectful to anyone who never aspires to do a farm as a business. But I believe very strongly that if, if our tribe, and I'm going to just assume we're in this tribe here unless there's some Monsanto plant in the crowd, um, <laughs> If our tribe is going to actually move to a tipping point, which is generally about 10%, right now in the food system, we're at about arguably 2 to 2.5%. Two so we're just beginning to move past, you know, what Malcolm Gladwell and people call the, the lunatic fringe. Okay, I'm, I'm a lunatic fringe. Okay, I, yep, I get it. Um, but then, then you move into the early adopters. And then the tipping point for societal movement usually comes in the 10 to 12 to 15 percent range. Then suddenly there's this, this cascade of, of where 
because 90% of society follows everyone else. You know, uh, say that as long as the NFL is on TV and there's nachos and beer in the refrigerator and the roof is over our head, life is good. You know, that's all that matters, okay? And so our tribe has a much, you know, more, um, whatever, uh, uh, eclectic value system than that. And we have to lead. And if we're going to lead, we have to have models. We have to have templates that actually attract young people, that, that, that attract full-timers. And, and so I'm a big proponent that if you want to farm, if that is really what fires your soul and is the passion of your life, let's figure out how to do it. You know, why should we have to um, uh, be addicted to the town job to farm? So seven fears, let's go through these. It's seven fears and their solutions. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the fear, and then I'm going to give you some solutions, all right? That's the way this is going to go. And I, I, you know, I'm old school. I mean, I don't even have a smartphone. I've got a dumb phone, you know, flip phone. Uh, so I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm just going to try to hold your attention by the power of theatrics, okay? So, <laughs> so here we go. The first fear is the fear of knowing enough. How do I do this? What do I do first? Where do I start, right? These are serious, um, debilitating questions. They stop us, right? Because we, we're fearful, we, we, don't, we feel like we don't know enough. All right, solution, several solutions. First of all, start with what you like. You know, I always, people say, well, what should I grow? I say, well, grow what you like to eat. You might have to eat your way through your inventory. So at the end of the day, do what floats your boat. Do what you like to do. What Singing Frogs has done is phenomenal. Jean-Martin Fortier, right? Phenomenal. Uh, ben Hartman, Lean Farm, phenomenal. Some people even think that what we've done is phenomenal, okay? The point is, there are the, you know, Elliot Coleman, I mean, you know, we could go down this, this litany of these gurus, you know, Greg Judy and Lifestyle, but everybody has framed their operation, their, their business within a context. A and every context is different, whether it's a Mediterranean climate, you know, a, a, a Siberian climate like Edmonton, <laughs> or, or uh, you know, a tropical climate like Florida, and the people are different, the cultures are different, the, the communities are different, values are different. You know, some communities don't know what arugula is. You might not want to grow arugula, you know, if your community doesn't know what arugula is. But, <clears throat> but, um, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, do what interests you. Everybody's got their little, here's what worked for me, all right? Well, what somebody else tells you is their magic formula may not work in your context. So ultimately, you have to live with yourself. You've got to go to bed at night really satisfied and, ex and excited about what you're doing. And by the way, most of the time, most of the time, produce and livestock don't excel on the same pair of legs. And that's why successful businesses tend to, you know, tend to move uh, into either livestock or produce. And the ones that do extremely well with both usually aren't done by one farmer. They're done by some sort of a partnership or collaboration or, you know, uh, some sort of team. So expose yourself to lots of options and find out what resonates. Take the time to, to plant a lot of different things, to do a lot of things for things, to try a lot of different things, and find what resonates with your soul. Because ultimately, none of us, none of us, does this for the pay. We do it for the passion, we do it for the joy of it, we do it for what feeds our soul. So you have to take time to find what feeds your soul. Two, do the opposite of industrial anything. Okay? The conventional advice is always wrong. 
you know, when, when, when dad was trying to figure out how to make a living on our farm, he went to all these experts and, you know, every one of them from, from public to private to whatever said, you know, graze the woods, plant corn, build silos, borrow more money, build a Tyson chicken house, you know, and that is still the advice of 90% of the, uh, whatever, orthodox agriculture community, okay? So, you know, we're... We're responsible for the mentors and the teachers we pick. And if you don't want to use GMOs or CAFOs or herbicides, don't go to a teacher who is using that kind of material. You're looking for a mentor that you want to be like. Okay? So, do the opposite of industrial anything. Three, start small. Think embryos. We live in a time when most businesses, when somebody has an idea and this idea frames in their head, the first thing everybody pushes them to do is, wow, how big can that be? And at Polyface, our first question about an idea is always, cool, how small can it be? Because if it's not, if it doesn't work small, generally it won't work big. And all prototypes are hatched embryonically. They're not hatched. You don't see a, you know, a 80-foot oak tree suddenly appear in the field. You know, it starts from a little acorn, which is the smallest viable life form of that big critter, right? And so, and, 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 the, and the reason it has to start small is because that is the most resilient. You know, it can roll, it can, it can float down a creek, it can, it can uh, land on the soil, it can go through the gut of a, of a pig or, or something, okay, and still be viable, And whereas a big oak tree would have trouble going through the alimentary canal of a pig. So, <laughs> so the question is always, how small can it be? Um, you know, you, you want to try things that don't sink the ship. Innovate with prototypes. Test things before going whole hog. That's another big business principle. Test things. Run, run tests on a, on a very small scale. You know, the first time you want to do pastured poultry, don't buy a thousand chicks. Okay? Get 50. All right? And, and see how you get along. Number four, start something. All right, start something, anything. Fill your space. Do you have a patio? Do you have a roof? Do you have um, a, a, a spot under your sink where you can put a vermicomposting kit? All right, but, but start with something in your space. Throw out the dog, the cat, the gerbil, and the, and the, you know, the pet uh, boa constrictor and, and, and put in two chickens, okay? And, you know, they can eat your kitchen scraps, lay a couple eggs for you, and you'll start to learn about the joy of chickens. And if you have teenagers, there's nothing better as a, as a, um, uh, as a mentor for your teenagers than a chicken. I mean, they're the, first, they're the first animal up in the morning. They're up before the cow and the pig and the sheep and all that stuff. They're, they spend all day scratching around, finding trash, and turning it into egg treasure happily. And as soon as the sun starts to go down, they go to bed. You know, what a perfect uh, um, you know, object lesson for teenagers. <laughs> so just start something. Movement, remember, movement creates movement. And, and, and um, yeah, it's okay to do business plans, but do the business plan just to push yourself through the thinking cycle. Do the business plan and put it away and never look at it. Because it will never look like the business plan, okay? That's an exercise to just push you to think through what you're trying to do. But trust me, there's not a business plan in the world that five years adhered to plan, am I right? Nothing. I mean, you've got all these swerves in the rows and, and kinks and all sorts of funny things, good and bad, that can happen that will affect it. But, but, but so, so don't fret about, well, five years and 10 years. No, 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 no. Five years is going to be the culmination, the manifestation of five times 365 days done correctly. Okay? That's the way it works. So you do what you're supposed to do tomorrow, 
and the day after tomorrow will take care of itself, and five years will take care of itself. A lot of times we fear going way out there in the future when actually we just need to solve with, well, what should I do tomorrow? You know, and if we can get that nailed down, suddenly the future takes care of itself. Remember that good enough is perfect. Some of us, some of us grew up in households, and we can still remember that matriarch or patriarch. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. That's wrong. You know why? You know what the truth is? The truth is, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly first. We don't do anything right first. I mean, we, we, we're born, we, we don't walk well, we don't talk well, we don't, you know, we don't, well, I guess we poop fine, we just don't know where to put it. I mean, you got all these things, right, that, that we, we don't do well, and, and it takes time, all right? And so, I mean, can you imagine a, you know, a Thanksgiving dinner and everybody's gathered around, you know, all the dysfunctional family and crazy Uncle Tom and all that stuff. And, and, and we have this dinner and little Amy, Emily Sue, you know, she's, she's like, whatever, you know, nine months or 10 months, something like that. Emily Sue, you know, she's the newest addition to this, you know, dysfunctional family like most of us have. And she's climbing around on the floor. And, um, and suddenly, her mom probably was the first one to see her, and she says, and, you know, here's Emily Sue, she's over here you know, on, on a chair leg, you know, and she's just pulling herself up, you know, and she's kind of tired. And, and suddenly, you know, mom looks at her and she says, oh, look at Emily Sue, she, she, she's standing, it's the first time she's stood, you know, she's all excited. Well, suddenly, you know, everybody looks at Emily Sue, they're all excited, Emily Sue realizes, you know, she's the center of attention, you know, and suddenly she loses her concentration and plop down on her diaper, right? What does everybody do? Well, Emily Sue, if you can't walk any better than that, just quit. Because <laughs> if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. <laughs> no, we say, oh, good, good, give me your hand. Let's try it again. <laughs> right, right. You know? and, and so, so as we come to our enterprises, I want to free you up from this idea that if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. No, actually, it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. Because that's how we learn. We have people that are that are scared to cook a meal from scratch because I might burn the chicken. Well, so what? <laughs> Think what you'll learn from a burned chicken. You know, you'll learn how fast Papa John's can make a delivery. I mean. <laughs> So what you want is, here's the deal, folks. You want function over form. And so often we get, we get, uh, we, we call it um, uh, paralysis by analysis because we're all keyed up on form, which is supposed to look like, instead of just working on function and letting form grow out of function. Okay. <clears throat> Mastery only comes when you've repeated it enough times to see it in every conceivable situation. Now, you know, I can, I can gut a chicken in 20 seconds, okay? I can teach anyone how to gut a chicken in about 10 minutes. I can teach you how to gut a chicken, anybody, all right? But you don't become a master at it until you've done your 3,467th chicken, okay? until you've done a big chicken and a little chicken, an old chicken and a young chicken, a chicken on a hot day and a chicken on a cold day, a chicken on a rainy day, a chicken on a dry day, chick uh, chicken with, 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 you know, with, a, with, with a full GI tract, a chicken that you didn't get to feed away from, it has a full crawl, all right, um, crop. I mean, there's a million different, you know, uh, uh, an old stewing hen compared to a young broiler, uh, you know, a heritage bird compared to a Cornish cross. I mean, there's a million nuances and it takes time to develop mastery. Don't worry about mastery. Did you worry about mastery the first day you jumped in the, the swimming pool? No. You just jumped in the pool, started paddling around, and, you know, you, you get better at it. Or you drown, I guess. <laughs> Here's the deal. The earlier you start, the earlier you'll get your 10,000 hours in. See? That's what's important. The earlier you start, the, first, the earlier you get your 10,000 hours in. All right, number two, the second fear. You ready? Second fear is acquiring land. Oh, no. 
How am I gonna how am I gonna get this land? How can I afford to buy land? Where should I buy land? Um, there's all this this these, these land things. All right. Generally, we can do a lot of things if we start, I'm not going to say this is where we're going to end up, but if we start by mentally divorcing land ownership from farming, that frees us up to start. Do you know how many niches? Look at that wonderful, look at those wonderful pictures of, um, of the, the, Bronx, the Bronx Gardens. That you saw. I mean, that's the most inhospitable environment you can imagine. Remember the slide with all the junk on the left and then the garden on the right? I mean, <laughs> think of what it took to visualize that little, I mean, what was that strip? That was like a little, you know, uh, whatever, 40 foot by 8 foot strip of, of a bunch of plastic bags and, you know, soda bottles and cans and stuff. To be able to sit, to, to stand there and visualize that as a garden. That's pretty cool, okay? The essence of a farm is not the land necessarily, but what a farmer does to the land. This is my problem with all the, the farm preservation efforts and land trusts and all that stuff. They're all about preserving farm land, and they're not about preserving farmers. And if you don't preserve farmers, you don't preserve farm land. Okay? So let's start with not getting hung up and paranoid about owning the land. All we have to do is get access to the land. And there are a lot of opportunities, as you've already seen, in the urban sector, uh, in, in lots of sectors. And, and what happens is, remember, movement creates movement. So you get on, I mean, my favorite story is this, out, this lady in... Um, in uh, Calgary, big city, Calgary, Canada, lived in a fifth floor uh, condominium, desperately wanted a farm, had no money, no land, no nothing, but she had one friend who had a backyard. She went to her friend with a backyard, she says, oh, can I just put a 10 foot by 10 foot uh, garden spot in your backyard? Oh, sure, sure, we got room for that, it's fine, go ahead. She went and put the 10 by 10 in. Well, the neighbor saw that garden, she came to the, to the neighbor and said, wow, that's a beautiful garden. You think your friend would put a garden in my backyard? I don't know. I'll ask her. Well, sure. You know, within 18 months, she was farming almost 20 backyards, had a half-time employee, was a full-time farmer. Her whole farm were tools on the sides of a bicycle. She, 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 she took her entire farm from backyard to backyard, full-time farming in the middle of Calgary with no debt, no land, no nothing. And the title of her, the name of her business was, is On Borrowed Ground. Is that not cool? Okay. So every time I meet somebody that's stuck here and stopped at this, I've just seen some of the most amazing things. I mean, Michael Abelman in, uh, you know, in uh, Salt Spring Island in, on, in Vancouver. I mean, he, he, he's farming in, uh, in, in tool, you know, uh, the Chinese and Japanese, Chinese mainly in Pakistan, he send us uh, tools. They send them in uh, totes, little uh, black totes. And so he repurposes, I mean, they're about millions, right? And, and he takes these and takes spent mushroom tailings, fills them up, and he has portable farms all over Vancouver and parking lots and all this, and he just, with a flatbed and a, and a skid steer, he could set up a farm in tubs, and if the land gets sold or they decide to do something else with it, he just loads them all up and moves them up the street to another vacant place, and he's just got a completely portable farm, okay? So the first solution here to this land thing is to have a mobile farm, a mobile infrastructure. I call it nook and cranny farming. Uh, there's, there's no building permits. There's no real estate taxes, no depreciation, because you don't even have a machine. I mean, expense it all, just, just a mobile farm. A modular farm. One of the beauties of what we do with our pastured poultry and all the different things that we do is all of our infrastructure is modular, okay? And that means that you can start with one. And so expansion does not occur with making a bigger building. Expansion occurs by duplicating the modular thing that you have. 
And that allows you to scale up seamlessly with retained earnings instead of capitalizing a massive mortgage on a big stationary uh, infrastructure place. It's easy to enter and easy to exit low upfront costs. Management intensive. Okay, we got three M's here: the mobile, modular, and management intensive. Of course, that's where the that's where the you know the opposition, the industrial folks, they point their finger at me and say, "I, I got you. I knew there was a catch here." Ear farming is management intensive. It takes more people. Yep, guilty. It's a terrible thing. Terrible thing to think about more people out on the land. I mean, it's just a terrible thing. I mean, the fact the fact that we're the first and only culture in the world that has twice as many people incarcerated in prison as we have farmers should give us pause. And when you're, you know, when you're like me and you write books about farming, like you, you can farm, it's, it's, it's quite you know, frustrating that I could have had twice as many possible sales if I wrote, like, you can be a successful inmate. But when you go to a management intensive model, suddenly you are moving your equity from depreciable physical infrastructure and moving your equity to information, skill, and customers. And you don't have to borrow information, skill, and customers from a bank, right? And that fundamentally changes the whole equity structure. Equity is, is, is invested in non-physical. So there are practical options. There's renting, caretaking. I mean, I ran into a guy the other day. He's farming. He, he's, um, the people run ads all the time, elderly care. And of course, you know, with the baby boomer generation, this is coming more and more people that want to stay at home if they can, don't want to go to an institution. And so there are ads all the time for somebody to come and like clean the house, fix a meal a day, that sort of thing. And maybe even live in house, you get free housing, you take care of this elderly person. And they might live on four or five acres or a hundred acres or whatever. And there are people all over the country who are starting farming serving the elderly as a, as a way in, okay? Now, they're elderly. They're not going to live forever. This, you know, this, isn't, this isn't a deal, and I don't want to say that disrespectfully, but you see what I'm saying. I mean, that, when you talk about starting, we're not talking about where you're going to end up, but you got to start, okay? And these are very cheap ways to get started. Um, partnering, squatting, all right? Um, <laughs> piggybacking, piggybacking on, a di on, on existing farms. There are many existing farms where you can build another enterprise. It's called stacking, it's called holonic farming, but the whole idea here is that you know, there, there's not an orchard in the country that couldn't use a pastured poultry operation underneath it to sanitize it. All right. or, or, or sheep to graze, or whatever. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's not a produce farm that couldn't handle a, a, a chicken operation. Maybe not a pasture, maybe it's, maybe it's a, you know, in, a, in a structure house with you know, deep bedding to handle all the, you know, the, the, the vegetable waste and things and, and uh, create uh, you know, uh, recycled manure. But the point is to piggyback enterprise on existing places. Third fear, oh boy, we're gonna run out of time. Third fear is financing. I'm going to run out of money. What happens when I don't have a paycheck? When do I leave my town job? Can we get this up and running fast enough? How are we going to do cash flow, payday to payday? Sometimes in farming, we have real long times between paydays, right? You know, because a lot of our income is, is seasonal and cyclical, and, and you got to make it to the next one. So this whole financial thing is a, is a big, big fear. All right. Solutions. Several ideas. First of all, enter debt-free. That means live cheaply. Cut your expenses by you know, growing your own food making your own clothes or you know going down to the thrift store the salvation army store turn off the air conditioner you know build a 
build a vine, you know, do the permaculture uh, uh, shade vine thing to suck, you know, make cool air go through your house. I mean, there's a whole lot of things you can do. You know, wear junk clothes. Stay home. You know, you're not living in the city. You don't have to go into the city for anything, all right? <laughs> if you want to live in the country, enjoy the country. You know, one of the problems here is that, and, and, and this afternoon's thing, we're going to talk about the tension often, you know, the, the, the big problem between a disagreement of expectations of life between husband and wife or, or your know, partners. So we're going to talk about that in the thing this afternoon. But the thing is, uh, you have to be content. To, if, if, you, if you love the farm and you really want to do this, then stay home. Um, you don't have to run to town. If you want you know, delivered pizza, go to town, live in town. But if you can't be excited with the, the awesomeness of nesting into the ecological womb on your farm, you're not going to be a very good farmer, okay? Um, don't do a mortgage. Or buy use and wait for deals. Be patient. Speed is expensive, okay? I always tell people to get a nest egg up to one year. That takes the pressure off. That's what Teresa and I did. It was very, very valuable. So we got a nest egg together that we could live on for a year because I didn't know whether we'd be able to make it or not. Worst case scenario, you go back to work for a while, but if you have a one-year nest egg that you can live on, you can, you can dive completely into your venture. And of course, this is assuming that you have, that you've done some trials and experiments and you've got a little bit of, you know, a little bit of expertise and savvy and stuff behind you. Um, you know, if you've never planted a radish, even with a one-year nest egg, I would not quit your town job and <laughs> decide to do a radish farm. Okay. But once you get to that point, then make your jump. Um, as far as, uh, you know, and, and then you can fill in with piecework. You know, if you're handy at all, uh, it's amazing how many things uh, people will hire done from, you know, fence building to, you know, helping to plant trees to put on a deck to change a light bulb. I mean, there's, you know, a million things that so so you can fill in with with piecework in the community and it'll get you circulating and in your in your community um, and, and cash flow you know think about enterprises that will generate turnover okay um, and 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 as you add enterprises only add seasonal complementary things um, if your busiest season right now is is April and May. Don't add another enterprise that will peak in its labor requirement in April and May. You know, if you're if you're underemployed in December and January, add think about what could I add in December and January that would help to employ me um, in the in, in the down season to create cash flow. Always uh, add enterprises that will complement that will fit. Um, the, the pressure that you already have in other things to make that labor curve a nice even curve for you and people you add to your team. Fear number four, the fear of labor. Who's going to do the work? What if we want to go away? I can't afford to hire employees. How can I get it all done? Now, I'm going to take this one real fast because this is one I'm going to really drill down on in the workshop to follow. But uh, very quickly, solutions to this, to this fear. First of all, love people. You know, most farmers are farmers because we don't like people. <laughs> the truth is, you can't do it all yourself, so don't even try. The gifts and talents necessary to run a successful enterprise, all those different gifts and talents don't grow on the same pair of legs. Okay? So you need partners to be sustainable, to be regenerative. In fact, I even go so far now as to say no farm or enterprise is actually sustainable or regenerative until it's generating two salaries from two different generations. Okay? Incentivize the team. 
again, I'm going to spend a lot more time on this. We don't want employees. We want commission-based. We want to carve out fiefdoms. Everybody wants a fiefdom, right? Lord of your fiefdom. Uh, give authority and autonomy. Uh, build collaborative and synergistic partnerships with memorandums of understanding. Again, I'm going to go into this. Subcontractors, turn them loose. Um, you know, it, so you, you, have, you have people that are stakeholders. Always look for your sweet spot. And your sweet spot will be the intersection of what you know, what you love, and what you're good at. What you know, what you love, what you're good at. And where those three universes intersect, that's your sweet spot. And the, and the challenge of all of us in our life is to keep trying to move our, our life energy into the intersection of what we love, what we know, and what we're good at. See, the fact is a lot of us are good at things that we don't love. 80% of Americans say they hate their job. So we have skills at things that our heart's not in. Are you with me? And so that's what we call finding our soul, finding, finding the me of me, all right? And then, and then, of course, you know, create community. Uh, people can cover for each other. Cross training. Uh, leverage individual gifts and talents and share equipment. All right. Number five, the fifth fear. Marketing, the fear of marketing. All right, I'm going to produce this. But what if not enough people are interested in, in, in my stuff? You know, or I can't sell anything. That petrifies me. You know, the thought of making a cold call, ugh, you know, it makes me break out in hives. The, the wrapped up in this fear is the fact that, that if they don't buy, they're rejecting me and I'll get depressed. Right? Because we farmers... You know, the stuff that we grow, the, the squash and the eggs and the whatever that we're doing, it's, a, it's an extension of our, it's our, it's our self-affirmation, right? And so when somebody doesn't buy my cheese or somebody doesn't buy my tomato, we, <laughs> we, we take that personally because they don't like me, you know. And that fear of rejection is, is a real fear. And of course, you know, the other fear of this marketing thing is, well, if I go out and I tell people that I have the best eggs or the best, you know, arugula or whatever, um, I'm going to appear selfish, and greedy, and, and mercenary, I, you know, I, because we farmers, we, we, carry this, we carry this burden on our back, you know, feeding the world. You know, we say no farmers, no food, and we, we feel this this. The, the, the orthodoxy of our culture is that we farmers are supposed to walk around with this massive burden on our back of, of feeding the world. I'm feeding, I'm obligated to feed the world, you know. It doesn't matter if you like me or don't like me or you don't want to pay anything or you're happy if I go out of business. I'm supposed to feed the world, you know. And we have this, this big cultural social pressure on our back that, I've got to feed these people, you know, this obligatory thing. And, and it drags us down, and it, and it makes us, it makes us uh, 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 timid, right, to actually knock on somebody's door and say, you know, I got the best egg in the world, and I want you to try this. You proud, arrogant, give me those eggs. You're supposed to be feeding me, feeding the world, you know. So I, I appreciate these fears. I mean, they, they are, and, and not, not just that, but the, but the fear of, of irritating the neighbors. Hey, did you hear what, you know, Farmer Alice says over her? She's got the best goat cheese. How dare she say she's got the best goat cheese? What, what gave her the right? She got a, somebody give her a, you know, a, a, a special, you know, halo of cheese or something? I mean, what's the deal with it? You know, and so we have the, we have the, we have the possibility um, the very real possibility of irritating the neighbors who don't quite see eye to eye in differentiating craft from commodity. <laughs> right? All right. So what's the answer to these fears? First of all, diversify the portfolio. We've heard a lot about diversity today. All right. I'm going to keep harping on it in the marketing. Remember this. It's much easier to find a hundred people who will spend a thousand dollars with you than a thousand people who will spend a hundred dollars. In marketing, the hard part is getting the person to darken your venue, whether your venue is a farmer's market, CSA, 
website, you know, drop spot, uh, farm, you know, on farm store. I don't care where your venue is. You never make money on the first customer, the, 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 the first time they buy, because it takes too much effort to get a customer. All right. But once you have a customer, if they like your cheese, they might like your eggs and they might like your tomatoes and they might like your children's toys and they might like your herbs. Are you with me? And so suddenly you take that existing customer who's already in love with you or they wouldn't come to your venue and, and you leverage that transaction by, again, this is permaculture, by stacking, layering on additional cornucopias of opportunity. So we take that customer from a hundred dollars to a thousand dollars and it's so you're going to hear it one more time it's much easier to find a hundred people who will spend a thousand dollars with you than a thousand people who will spend a hundred dollars with you okay so we're always thinking now that doesn't mean you have to grow it all it means that you might form collaboratives i mean one of our most successful ones was with an orchard nearby an organic orchard, one of the oldest ones in the, in the world, A.P. Thompson. Uh, he was a featured plowboy interview in Mother Earth News in like 1972. I was in high school, you know, and I read this story about this apple orchard. We went up, and ever since we've been, you know, buying their apple juice. They, they, they cold press it. I mean, it's the real thing. I mean, they cold press it. These gallon jugs, there's about an inch of sediment in the bottom of the jug. You got to, you know, shake it up. And in January, you know, you can... It's so good. You can drink two glasses and suddenly realize, ooh, I just ate six apples. And you spend 24 hours kind of working through the <laughs> apple juice. <clears throat> so A.P. Thompson died and his son took over the, the, the orchard. And A.P. built the business. He was a gregarious storyteller. Schmoozer could sell a, you know, uh, Eskimo ice. And um, so... So um, his son took over, and, and John, his son, is arguably a better orchardist. He's actually a better pruner, manager. You know, he actually tends the orchard better, but he's not a marketer. Bad weather. Can't get no help. So I was watching the business do a downward trajectory. I went to John. I said, John, would you mind if we added your apple juice to our customer queue? Oh, I'd love it. We now move like 60% of all the apple juice the whole orchard produces to our customers and the delivery, what we charge by the pound to our 5,000 metropolitan buying customers, the, the, the delivery price itself on just the apple juice pays for all of our gas bill so all of our meat, eggs, and poultry are free. All right? So, so we've got to start thinking not competition but collaboration and complementarity. Who's doing some, some, some of the quickest up and running farms I know are livestock, pastured livestock farms who hook up with vegetable CSAs. Because if you're in a vegetable CSA, you've already drunk the Kool-Aid. You know, you, you're in, okay? You have vetted yourself, all right? While you're picking up the tomatoes and the arugula and the microgreens, you can pick up a pork chop and a pound of hamburger. Are you with me? And so this collaborative idea is really critical. We've, we've just teamed up this year. It's so exciting. Um, a new grass-based dairy has just come into our, our thing. 100% grass-based, A2, A2, um, uh, raw milk. Um, and they've actually hooked up with a creamery, the only one in the state that does vat pasteurization, so it's legal. We don't have uh, raw milk, it's not legal in Virginia. So they do this low temperature uh, um, vat uh, pasteurization so it can be legal. Our customers are going nuts over this milk. We think that when we add their kefir yogurt milk and chocolate milk to our queue this summer, it's, gonna, it's just going to make our sales go crazy. We've, uh, we've got a, 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 a group that does fermentation, lacto-fermentation. We've got everything from you know, kimchi to, to sauerkraut, everything, and, and they're going nuts over that. Uh, a kombucha, all right? We've, we've teamed up with a kombucha uh, outfit. We offer you know, six varieties of kombucha. Our customers love that. So, so, so collaboration, okay? So you get this cornucopia of opportunity, honey, vegetables, apple, you know, whatever you can do. Soap, I mean, you know, children's toys, um, um, you know, cut flowers. I mean, just just keep <laughs> keep adding things, all right? Um, 
bring on commission-based partners. You know, um, uh, again, I'm going to delve into this a lot more in a workshop. But when I say you need partners, I'm not talking about you hiring somebody. I'm talking about commission-based people who share risk and are not guaranteed any salary. They only, they only get paid on performance. That takes the pressure off of you and allows you to add partners without the risk of having to pay their salary if they don't perform. Okay, we're going we're gonna to drill into that a lot more. Um, okay, uh, electronic aggregation, all right, and, and, and I'm sure all of you are very aware that we are moving into a time of electronic aggregation. There's all sorts of, 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 of stuff coming on. You know, 35% of our sales, even though we only go four hours from the farm, they're still done on an electronic shopping cart where we can aggregate from these other collaborative farmers that we work with and put that all on a, on, on a website so we don't have to have a bricks and mortars warehouse, okay? And, 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 and this allows us to inventory stock in cyberspace. And so this, this, this retail interface, this, this, this electronic non bricks and mortar interface, I don't need to tell you it's coming fast. And, um, and we can, we can love it. We can hate it. We can do whatever we want to, but, um, I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm telling you it's coming. Okay. And, um, and so we need, to be, we need to be savvy about this. One of the beauties of electronic retail interfaces is that as a farmer, I don't have to sit there at farmer's market or this, this, this physical interface and talk to all these people and, 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 pat my, and wait for, well, John, honey, you know, they're out of pork chop, so what do you want to do instead? You want to ribeye steak? You know, it takes them 30 minutes to make this decision. Instead now, they can talk about this, you know, at 12 o'clock midnight, in the bedroom and then push by at 1 a.m. and it pops in on our website while we're sleeping. Okay? And um, we, we actually did, uh, three years ago, we actually did a very, very detailed audit analysis of the cost of a, of a retail dollar on our different, we, we have a guy that goes to farmer's market, we've got a guy, we, we do the restaurants, so there's about 50 restaurants, we do the Metropolitan Buying Clubs, we have an on-farm uh, store, we do a couple of uh, uh, supermarket things, and institutional things, and, and so we actually spread these different uh, uh, market venues out and did an analysis on what does it cost us to get a dollar, what, what's, the, what's the marketing overhead of this dollar in this venue, this venue, are you with me? Everybody see this? Our cheapest one was the electronic interface. That was, that was half the cost of our on-farm sales building, which vexed my soul because that's, my, that's what I like most, right? Um, but you know, it is, it just is. Um, and, 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 and I'll just say this, don't be on this whole uh, marketing thing, don't be too weird. <laughs> you know, you can be a Buddhist and you can be a nudist, but a nudist Buddhist is just too weird. <laughs> so, it's okay to be different. But if you're too weird, people won't buy from you. <laughs> so sell common things. And you can sprinkle around the edges the uncommon stuff. But do the common things. All right? So be careful about exotics. Don't, and don't fret the uninterested. Leverage the choir. You know, the 80-20 rule. Look, you're not trying to sell to people that are buying their food from the filling station. That's not our tribe. <laughs> and you're gonna and you're gonna burn yourself out and get frustrated and depressed if you think that you're gonna get them to buy your stuff. Okay? So so identify the tribe, go for them. It's all about their needs. All right. Fear number six, quickly. The fear of business. We, in, in our movement, our ecology movement, we kind of have this, this, this overriding thing, I think, sometimes that, 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 that business is bad. Um, what if I make a profit? You know. 
Oh no. You know, profit is selfish, greedy. That's what, that's what Monsanto does. Uh, administration, accounting, insurance. Oh no, my head will explode. Maintaining margins and keeping bills paid. This is scary stuff. What if somebody sues me? You know, all this, this, this business stuff. All right, solution. Bookkeepers and accountants are everywhere. Hire one. As my son Daniel says, he says, you know the thing that you hate to do when you get up this morning? For many of us, it's like doing our paperwork and our accounting and our financials. Did you know that there's somebody probably in your community that can't wait to wake up in the morning and do that kind of thing? <laughs> get them on board. Okay? Because that, that allows us to be part of the empowerment of facilitating other people to let their gifts and talents show. So if we sit here and stubbornly blunder along and I'm going to make this work, we deny somebody else the expression of their personal affirmation. Okay? So let somebody else do it. Categorize everything. Know your enterprise margins. Do your time and motion studies. Nobody owes you a living just because you're a noble farmer. Okay? So you're going to save the world. Who cares? Keep a personal time card so you can create benchmarks. How long does it take to put away a dozen eggs? How long does it take to plant 10 feet of, of, of head lettuce? Uh, this is the basis for your commission, subcontracting packages, and, and all that. Create your standard operating procedures, SOPs. Stay in your unfair advantage. Ask yourself, brainstorm, what is it that we can do that's different, that's more efficient than anybody else can do. And then stay there. You can't, you can't do everything for everybody. So enjoy your niche and then form collaborations to supplement it and create fits. Shop around for insurance and don't tell your agent everything you do all the time. Um, <laughs> form an LLC, separate your business from your personal assets. That'll give you a bit of protection. Um, you know, and remember your chance of being sued is in direct proportion to the amount of insurance you have. So the more you have, the bigger your risk of being sued. Um, and remember that profit, profit is the lifeblood of sustainability. It's, it's what keeps you in business. It's what attracts young people. So it's the key to succession as well. Nobody, want, nobody is attracted to a business with a downward financial trajectory. They're attracted to business with an upward financial trajectory. And finally, in closing number seven, the seventh fear, the fear of being optimistic. You know, again, in our movement, because we care and because we tend to be fairly eclectically read, we understand that a lot of things are going to the pits. Okay? Um, pessimism is fun. We love being negative. I mean, that's why we call them stoplights and not go lights. You ever come back from town and say, honey, guess how many go lights I hit today? <laughs> we, we dwell on what stops us, not what makes us go, right? You know, don't you know we're running out of everything? Ah, you know, the sky's falling, collapses on the horizon. I can't afford to have a big vision when we're all doomed anyway. <laughs> all right. So what's the solution to this? Vision. Vision drives everything. Concentrate on what you'd like your community to be like and then make it happen. Make a list. What would you like to see in your community? What would you like to see in your life? Here's a good question. If time or money were not an issue, what would I do tomorrow? Now go do it. Okay? Don't worry about what all's going out there. You know, Stephen Covey in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talks a lot about the sphere of influence. And the fact is, most of us are stopped from doing what would float our boat because we are paralyzed about not being able to float everybody else's boat. Well, I'm a big believer in a Chinese proverb, if everybody sweeps in front of their own house, the whole world would be clean. Okay? Ultimately, I can't float your boat. I can't float your boat. I can't float your boat. My responsibility and your responsibility is to float my boat and figure out the context and the habitat that will float my boat. And if I do that, it will encourage you and empower you and inspire you. You'll float your boat where you are. You'll float your boat, right? 
Okay, so don't get caught up in every, all this big stuff. Sleep in front of your own house. People love big missions and sacred causes. They're magnetic. They draw people. The solution to this fear of optimism is, you know, you're not just in a farmer, a farmer, you're, you're an ecology masseuse. Do something that's noble enough to attract the best and brightest youngster. Fire their fantasy. And let me tell you what, if carbon sequestration, growing earthworms, and solving the, 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 the human microbiome uh, uh, sickness problem is not a noble and sacred enough and righteous cause to fire the fantasy of any millennial, I don't know what will. Broaden your borders, read eclectically, expose yourself to healers, to economy, motion, and ecology. Okay, read. And finally, the solution to this optimism problem is remember that faith eventually trumps fear. Faith in the creator's design template, faith in the integrity and righteous food uh, uh, movement, and faith in the ultimate abundance of the earth as an object lesson of mercy and grace. Now may all of your, may all of your carrots grow long and straight. <laughs> may your radishes be large but not pithy. May tomato blossom end rot affect your Monsanto neighbor's tomatoes. <laughs> may the coyotes be struck blind at your pastured chickens. May all of your culinary experiments be delectably palatable. May the rain fall gently on your fields, the wind be always at your back, your children rise and call you blessed, and may we all make our nest a better place than we inherited. Thank you, God bless you, thank you so much. For